Hello and welcome to Euphoria TV Breaking News. My name is Dr David Bull, I'm a medical journalist and I'm delighted to be your host for this, our second show of January 2021. Now this show concentrates on the latest research into allergy and asthma. In a minute, I'll be talking to Professor Christian Verkoff, Head of Pneumology and Intensive Care Medicine from Rostock University in Germany about the latest breakthroughs in asthma research and treatment. I'll also be talking to Professor Dr. Lucas van Ordenhove from Leuven University in Belgium about his latest research into allergic rhinitis. Now, it's estimated that more than 339 million people suffer from asthma globally. It's a public health problem not just for high-income countries, but occurs in all countries regardless of the level of development. Most asthma-related deaths occur in low and lower-middle income countries. It's also underdiagnosed and undertreated and creates substantial burden to individuals and families. Well, to tell us more about the latest breakthroughs in asthma care and treatment, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Christian Verkoff, Head of Pneumology and Intensive Care from Rostock University in Germany. Christian, tell me, um, what do you believe is the latest and most important breakthrough in asthma research in, say, the last half year? Maybe the most important finding recently has been... Um a clinical study with an antibody against um, a TSLP, which is a um, uh, uh, activator of immunological processes um, uh, considered to be relevant for the pathogenesis of asthma. And using this monoclonal antibody, atezepelumab against this TSLP seems to improve asthma control relatively well in different forms of asthma. So that would be at the moment, if you ask specifically for the six months um, uh, that have passed, the most, most important finding in my view. What research of yours has had the most impact on patients suffering with asthma? Well, I had the fortune of being involved in, in two major studies in the past few years. One looked at the effect of sublingual immunotherapy in patients with asthma, and we were able to show that this does have a somewhat disease-modifying potential by replacing the need for inhaled corticosteroids in these patients. And that led to the um, uh, introduction of immunotherapy into the national and international guidelines. And the second study that I was fortunate to be involved in um, was published recently. It was the first study looking at triple inhaler therapy, which contains inhaled steroids, long-acting beta-2 agonists, and long-acting muscarinic antagonists in one um, uh, device that of course was available already in different devices but in 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 a attempt to simplify treatment for patients and avoiding errors in dosing regimens and so on this triple therapy is something that is definitely new and other studies have with you using other compounds but basically the same um, um, concept have confirmed these study results which um, uh, improve asthma control in patients with more severe asthma but especially simplify treatment for patients and for caregivers. So given the wealth of research that's going on what do you believe are the promising areas then in terms of research into the field of asthma and I suppose the ones that you believe will have the the most impact a major impact on practice? Well, there's a number of, again, monoclonal antibodies still being um, developed and investigated. Currently, we do have very um, uh, interesting and promising molecules already available. And I think areas of research will be the, how these um, compounds work on comorbidities such as nasal polyposis, allergic rhinitis. And we might, in fact, have a potential, I say this very carefully, but I think we should not give up hope there that by a proper combination of these um, uh, antibodies, we might actually 
be able to use them in primary prevention or even heal asthma in some patients if introduced at the right moment. But this is certainly, um, um, I, I hope, backed up by some some data and understanding of mechanisms that these new compounds also um, uh, allow us to understand better um, where we can interfere with these mechanisms. I mean, that really would be game changing. And of course, millions of people around the world are reliant upon your incredible research. So thank you very much indeed for talking to me, Professor Verkov. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. All the best. So from asthma, we now focus on allergic rhinitis. It's one of the most common chronic conditions for which medical care is sought. It's an IgE-mediated disorder of the nose caused by the interaction of airborne allergens with specific IgE-type antibodies on the surface of mast cells. Now, over 400 million people suffer from allergic rhinitis around the world, which to a large extent remains underdiagnosed and undertreated. So, to tell us more about his latest research into allergic rhinitis, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Dr. Lucas van Ordenhove, Associate Professor at University Hospitals in Leuven in Belgium. Lucas, thank you for joining me. Tell us about your latest research. What exactly have you discovered studying brain activation in allergic rhinitis patients using functional MRI scans? For this particular research, I teamed up with my colleague Peter Hellings, who um, is an allergic rhinitis specialist, and we joined forces and expertise to study brain responses to nasal histamine provocation um, in a small group of allergic rhinitis uh, patients uh, and compared them to um, healthy controls. So we basically found that while the um, response uh, at the level of the nose um, was was similar to uh, between the patients and the controls um, brain activation in response to histamine provocation versus saline um, differed uh, between patients and controls in a number of brain regions particularly regions involved in what we call interoception which is basically the mapping of the physiological state of the body, of the entire body, um, that is going on um, uh, all the time, actually, continuously uh, in our brain. Were you surprised that there was such significant activation of all those cortical areas? I mean, I read it was the insula, the superior temporal gyrus, the putamen, and so on. Were you surprised by that? Um, to be honest, we did not have super clear hypotheses because this, uh, as far as I know, was the first study of its kind. But I did expect to see regions like that um, because we know that these regions are interested in processing of all kinds of uh, physiological or pathological signals uh, from the body. So obviously it's incredible science, but the question really is, what's the relevance of this research in, uh, into patients themselves? Well, that's a good question. I think it's early days um, to talk about relevance for patients themselves. This is a very first, uh, I would say, proof of concept study in a small group that requires uh, confirmation. And I think a number of steps need to be taken before we can really um, turn this into something that is relevant for patients. However, I do think it, it shows proof of concept that in addition to local reactions at the level of the nose, uh, the central nervous system and the processing of these afferent signals from the nose in the central nervous system may play a more important role when it comes to symptom generation or symptom perception in these patients. So now that you've obviously established that there is interaction between nasal inflammation and brain activation, I suppose the million dollar question is what's next in terms of your research? Well, what we don't know um, from this study is what is really driving these differences in brain responses between these allergic rhinitis patients and healthy controls. You could assume that it's basically the central nervous system processing 
increased levels of input from the nose in these allergic rhinitis patients um, uh, because they have a stronger response to histamine there. So then the brain would just process higher levels of afferent input. However, there are a few arguments in our data against that. On the other hand, in the anterior insula, which is an integrative region where, where signals from the body are integrated with emotional input and, 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 and cognitive input and, and where actually conscious perception or con consciousness even or conscious sensations, we saw a stronger response in the allergic rhinitis patients compared to the healthy controls, which may point to the fact that um, there are differences at the the level of the brain um, when it comes to processing these signals in allergic rhinitis patients versus healthy control. So what I think would be a very interesting thing to do besides replicating the study in a larger um, uh, sample would be to collect more peripheral data um, to be able to see whether a variety of peripheral uh, readouts are are driving the differences in brain response and also collect some more um, brain data uh, particularly uh, looking at histamine release or, or histamine receptor binding in the brain in these regions which we can do with a technique called positron emission tomography and we can actually um, in Leuven even use this technique uh, at the same time as fMRI so it would really be interesting certainly from my side as a brain scientist to look at the neurotransmitter mechanisms uh, receptor uh, mechanisms at the level of the brain brain that are driving these differences in responses. Well, it sounds uh, very exciting indeed, and clearly there's a great deal of research that still needs to be done. Thank you so much indeed for your time. That's Professor Van Ordenhove. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, that is it for this edition of Euphoria TV Breaking News. Many thanks to my guests, Professor Van Ordenhove and Professor Verkoff, for their insights into the latest developments in allergic rhinitis and asthma. Now, don't forget, you can find more information about Euphoria and register for the Euphoria meetings on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Euphoria. But that's it for this show. See you soon, and thank you for watching. <laughs>